Hello and welcome to this special Lowy Institute conversation with Kurt Campbell, Deputy Assistant to President Joe Biden and the Coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs on the US National Security Council. This conversation marks the opening of the Lowy Institute's digital conference, the Indo-Pacific Operating System, Power, Order and Rules for the 21st Century. I'm Michael Fullilove, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, as well as traditional owners of country throughout Australia, and pay my respects to elders past and present. We begin with Kurt Campbell. For many years, Kurt has been central to debates in Washington on America's policies towards Asia. He was the architect of the Pivot to Asia announced by President Obama in Canberra a decade ago. He also coined the term Indo-Pacific Operating System to describe the regional rules-based order. We like Kurt's snappy term so much, we decided to adopt it for this conference. I first met Kurt 20 years ago at the residence of the Australian Ambassador to the United States, when I was in Washington at the behest of Frank Lowy, writing a feasibility study for a new Australian think tank that would become the Lowy Institute. Kurt gave me good advice then, as he's done ever since. And in 2013, Kurt served as the Institute's inaugural Distinguished International Fellow and gave the first Owen Harry's lecture. Kurt Campbell served in senior positions in the Clinton and Obama administrations. This year, President Biden appointed him as Deputy Assistant to the President and coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs on the NSC, in which capacity Kurt has been at the center of important initiatives, including the Quad and AUKUS. Kurt is a strategist, an entrepreneur, and a public servant. I believe he's had a greater impact on US policy towards Asia than any other American official in living memory. He's also a good friend to Australia and to many Australians, including prime ministers of recent decades. Kurt, I'm honoured that you've agreed to speak with me today from the White House and to take some questions from our audience. Thank you, Kurt. Michael, uh, that's such a gracious introduction, and I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward uh, to being with you. I want to return uh, the compliment. No uh, think tank, no uh, do tank has done more than the Lowy Institute in advancing uh, how to think about Asia, how to think about the Indo-Pacific, how to think about Australia's role in the world. So I wanna congratulate you, tremendous work, and I'm grateful to have played a small role in uh, the trajectory of the Lowy Institute over the course of the last couple of decades. All right, thank you, Kurt. Let's get straight into it. To begin with, Kurt Campbell, tell us a bit about America's long-term ambition in the Indo-Pacific and tell us a bit about how the Indo how you see the Indo-Pacific operating system. Well, well, thank you. First of all, I think we have to begin with just fundamental understandings. And, and the first is that over the last 40 years, the greatest experience in wealth creation, in lifting people out of poverty, in promoting democracy, in supporting integration has taken place in the Indo-Pacific. It's a remarkable achievement, too often overlooked, uh, but uh, a tremendous achievement uh, and one that we have to look at very carefully. I think the United States has helped uh, play a role in that through a variety of mechanisms, Michael, keeping American markets open for the export of goods, the provision of security, supporting uh, freedom of navigation, which can seem uh, hard to kind of figure out what its role is, but it's incredibly important, uh, peaceful resolution of disputes. So it is a fabric of a number of different things woven together that has provided the confidence to countries ranging from Japan to Indonesia to basically uh, uh, experience the drama and the uh, tremendous uh, innovation of the last 40 years. So I, I see the operating system as a, uh, as a living thing uh, and, and something that is added to over time. I think sometimes people fall into a habit when describing or discussing American policy uh, as suggesting that our, our job is to somehow secure 
something from the past, that the operating system worked in the past and that our effort is basically to preserve uh, something from the status quo antebellum. And, and Michael, I would just simply say that I think that's a fool's error, that in, in reality, Asia is about moving forward and it's about working with other like-minded states about what are going to be the important ingredients in sustaining this operating system going forward. And I would say probably the most important is for the United States to truly, honestly, and with, with tremendous uh, uh, durability, work with partners and allies. This is not something that can be accomplished alone through faux consultation. This requires the deepest integration and engagement with partners and allies. You spoke about uh, looking to the future rather than clinging to the past. And we know that economics forms a more important part of geostrategic competition now and it will in the future than it did in the past in the Cold War. Um, you recently said that not having an economic strategy for the Indo-Pacific is like having one or two hands behind, tied behind your back and perhaps a foot as well. You're very good at the snappy phrase, Kurt. Um, what will it take the United States to break free and really develop uh, an economic strategy for the region? Well, look, you're already seeing elements of that taking shape now, Michael, in a variety of places. And I think sometimes uh, we tend to overlook certain elements of American economic power. We're the largest investor in most of the places uh, in the Indo-Pacific. The president, uh, in the last few weeks, in summits with the East Asia community, with APEC, articulated his vision of a uh, economic framework uh, that we are in the early stages of articulating and discussing with partners and friends that will be cutting edge in respect to issues associated with the digital economy, with uh, climate related features, worker rights. Um, we already had initial discussions with Sector Raimondo, who just returned from the region, also in consultation with Australian friends. I think we're very hopeful about those discussions and that we want to take uh, quick action and moving forward. But also there are other elements. Uh, the Build Back Better World will be about advancing efforts, uh, American efforts and investment in some key areas in infrastructure and climate. And so I, I think um, what's going to be important over time, uh, Michael, is for the United States to demonstrate that we do in fact understand that the region looks to the United States to have an open engaged, optimistic view that, yes, we bring defense and security uh, support to the Indo-Pacific, but that's not enough. Um, uh, our diplomacy is terrific. Ultimately, uh, the region seeks our efforts, not just in projects, but in the design of the standards that will uh, animate our technology uh, and innovativeness as we go forward. And I think the Biden administration is trying to signal despite our domestic challenges and some of the issues that we're dealing with, that we are committed to working uh, uh, purposefully in this endeavor. All right, let me ask you about some of the, the, the new diplomatic initiatives that your administration has, has uh, initiated. Um, and let me start with AUKUS. You played a critical role in the negotiation of AUKUS, which was announced by President Biden and Prime Ministers Johnson and Morrison in, in September. The centerpiece of that agreement is a commitment by the United States to share its nuclear submarine propulsion technology with Australia. This is one of the crown jewels of American technology. Why did the administration decide to make this commitment, Kurt? Largely because Australia is uh, an ally like no other. Um, I, I don't think it's a secret that a number of other countries have uh, asked over the years to be included in this partnership. And it's not, uh, it is the crown jewels. It is the thing that has separated the United States in terms of our operating capabilities under sea for decades. We've only done this once. It was almost 70 years ago. Imagine that uh, with Great Britain. Uh, it took the kind of ally, friend, and partner uh, like Australia to, uh, uh, to frankly persuade uh, some of the folks in our government and elsewhere that this was exactly the right strategic move at a critical time. So I would say AUKUS does many things, Michael. Uh, you touched on one, but
but it will do other things as well. And we've just brought on board an AUKUS administrator or strategist here at the White House, a friend uh, to Australia, Jim Miller, who had served in the Obama administration as undersecretary uh, for several years and a technologist in his own right. And his task over the next 18 months working with Australia and Great Britain is to basically do three things. The first is to help design an architecture that's going to bring our three countries closer together in defense and technology. That means more regular engagements at the highest level. And this has many advantages. We've met individually for decades with both countries, but never in combination among the three. It brings Britain more into the Indo-Pacific and it leads to more interoperability and engagement between the United States and Australia. So that's extraordinarily important. It will be ambitious. It will mean a regular tempo of engagements, of sharing of information, of intelligence. I think that's gonna be vital. The second is um, that I think we acknowledge that there will be some key technologies that will be animating in the 21st century. And some of those technologies have been pioneered outside of the United States. Uh, for instance, uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of work that Australia has done uh, in AI, in longer range systems. Uh, Great Britain has done some pioneering work in cyber. Our goal is to set up working groups and engagements that will allow us to meld and to mine capabilities that can be helpful in maintaining deterrence and uh, initiative on the technology and military uh, arena. And then lastly, as you mentioned, is to work expeditiously to provide Australia with the best options for how to field nuclear submarines to the Royal Australian Navy at the nearest possible uh, destination time. And in the meantime, to think about what other capabilities can uh, ensure that there's no gap in, um, in capacity. And so uh, it's, it's a tall task, but I believe that this is one of those initiatives. When we look back on the Biden administration, I believe it will be among the most significant things that we accomplish. And I think in 20 years, it will be taken as a given that our sailors sail together, our submarines port in Australia, and people will say, well, gee, hasn't already always been that way? No, it, it, it was started with the vision of Australia of Great Britain and the United States to drive this forward. You recently suggested that AUKUS could lead to almost a melding of US, Australian and UK forces in the Indo-Pacific. What did you mean by a melding and what implications does that have for Australia's national sovereignty and its uh, national freedom of, of decision and freedom of action? Look, I, I follow the Australian debate carefully. I fully understand how important sovereignty and ind independence uh, is uh, for Australia. So I don't want to leave any sense that somehow that will be lost. In this. That's not the, this, this arrangement is meant to be additive and create new capacities. I think what I'm suggesting is that, that Australian sailors will have the opportunity to serve on uh, American vessels and vice versa. I think you can expect American submarines to port more uh, uh, commonly in Australian ports. I think we're going to operate and share perspectives much more than we've done in the past, and we're already close allies. I, I, I think our overall capacities and our training will be uh, uh, much more common as we go forward. And for Australia to learn and to, become, and to master nuclear technology uh, of the kind that uh, is presented in submarines will require the deepest, most profound kinds of engagements with submariners in the United States and uh, Great Britain who work on nuclear submarines. That's going to be extraordinarily important and, and, and ultimately is going to lead to a kind of strategic intimacy that we think is going to be very important in the time ahead. You've also spoken about AUKUS as open architecture which other countries might join in time. Can you talk a little bit about that and what other countries do you have in mind? Thank, thank you, Mike. I, I will just simply say that, look, the, the nuclear uh, uh, arrangements between our three countries is, a, is set aside. That, that will only be uh, our three countries working together. There are sensitive technologies, sensitive agreements that we're in the midst of 
negotiating as we speak. Let's put that aside. But there is a recognition that we share partnerships and discussions, as does Australia, as do Australia, with a number of countries that are working in areas of uh, technology and military innovation, particularly cyber. And so I, I think in these discussions, this is an indication of the excitement that AUKUS has stirred. Many close allies have come to us in the immediate aftermath and said, can we participate? Can we engage? And it is to the credit, it is to the credit of Australia and Great Britain uh, that they insisted, yes, this is not a closed architecture. It's an open architecture. We want to work with partners in these key areas of military innovation as we go forward. So it hasn't been, you know, we, we've got time to design and to figure out what, where are the areas that have the most potential. I think cyber is going to be one, but there will be a number of other areas that I would expect other countries that will want to work with us. And again, this gets back to your original question, Michael. Ultimately, the goal of our strategy is not simply to surge independently in the United States, economically, politically, strategically. It is to work in partnership, in harmony with other countries uh, on a range of issues, including on technology as part of AUKUS. It is interesting, this fear of missing out um, that we've seen on behalf of some other countries. Um, you know, in the aftermath of America's withdrawal from Kabul, a lot of commentary around the world said that um, this showed that America had lost interest in its allies and its allies had lost faith in America. But I wrote at the time of AUKUS that AUKUS is a rebuttal of both those points. It's, it's very interesting to see uh, allies uh, reaching out and wanting to, um, to engage more closely with the United States on this. Of course, it wasn't all clear sailing, Kurt. Um, what did you make of France's reaction to the AUKUS announcement? And was the administration happy with the way Australia managed that side of the rollout? So, Michael, first, if I could, I want to go back to what you had described. And I do want to just suggest to you, you know, you know, when you're in these positions, they're challenging, you know, a lot of stuff breaking on across your bow every day. Um, the day that AUKUS came out, I got a, a, a tweet. Uh, it was actually from you. And I sometimes look at it and it says, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, people were saying that the United States you know, couldn't be trusted and, and its allies were deserting it. And then you had just one line after, not today. Um, a, a tremendous, I think, rebuttal to the idea that the United States still could not lead, still could not be a reliable partner. So I, I do want to say thank you for that. And I still glance at it occasionally. Frame it, Kurt. Uh, look, Frame it. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's, it's suitable for framing. It's a night, not today. So... <laughs> I, I, I will say uh, that, look, um, the president has been very clear about our desire to make sure that we're working as closely as possible with France. We have done so much in the last few weeks to indicate that that partnership is central and critical uh, as we go forward. Uh, I think we are very proud of the work that we've done on AUKUS. Uh, I believe, and I think we believe generally, that our relationship with Europe in the Indo-Pacific will only grow stronger. And at the same time, we will be able to look back on AUKUS as a significant achievement. So I, I, I do want to just uh, take us forward in this uh, and recognize the, uh, you know, all the work that we want to do together. And you will have seen that the United States has taken uh, uh, very serious efforts to ensure that our dialogue and our partnership and our engagement with our European allies in the Indo-Pacific um, remains strong and is growing over time. All right, let me ask you about the Quad. Um, Kurt, another file on your, on your um, desk, which has a, a big pile of files. You were in the East Room of the White House in September when the President hosted the first in-person meeting of the leaders of the, the four Quad countries. Let me ask you this, is it more important to deepen cooperation between the four members of the Quad, or to expand the Quad to include more members? It's, you know, Michael, it's such a good question and such a hard question, frankly. I, I think, look, I'm not going to speak for the leaders, 
But I will say, I think they've answered that question in the short term, which is that the most essential feature of the next year or so is to deepen uh, relations among the four countries. And I think that has been the uniform view of all the leaders. Um, the president asked this question directly, and he heard clearly from Prime Minister Modi, Prime Minister Suga, Prime Minister Morrison, the importance of deepening the work that we had done to date, but as importantly, to deliver what we had committed to, particularly in the realm of vaccines and climate. Um, I, I will say, I, I, you know, I, I do want to underscore, Michael, that the Quad is a bipartisan um, effort. It was begun under the George uh, W. Bush administration. Our good friend Mike Green, Steve Hadley, and others played a critical role in designing it in response to the Indonesian, uh, uh, the tragedy of the tsunami. Um, and it has waxed and waned over the course of the last you know, 16 or so years. And the Trump administration resurrected elements of this, but it was hard. They couldn't always call it the quad. They had difficulties sometimes issuing communiques. I think when President Biden came to office, he was determined that he would use this unofficial institution as a vehicle to underscore our commitment as maritime democracies to, again, this operating system. And the president pushed us every day, do what you need to do to get this going. And yes, initially there were perhaps some questions, some uncertainties, but the first virtual meeting that took place in um, the late winter, early spring of, last, of this year uh, helped set the table and created a degree of comfort among the four leaders that allowed us to, to, uh, to, to meet in person. And again, we will meet again next year. I, I will tell you, I, I have been involved with my team here at the White House and at the State Department. Michael, it would be remarkable if you saw the, the habits of cooperation that are developing before our eyes, the working groups, the, the engagement on issues from technology to education to climate to pandemic preparedness. You just go down the list, it is remarkable. And I will also tell you, it is deeply, almost a moving experience. Yeah, each of these leaders are, you know, you know, these are hard, lonely jobs. And when they met and engaged, you could see they could recognize each other. They're, they're at the top of these critical dynamic countries at periods of tumult and change. And there was a partnership that formed among these four leaders. Um, and I believe it will carry on and it represents the partnership among our four key countries as ocean going maritime democracies at the leading cutting edge of innovation and um, uh, prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Kurt, these leaders probably wouldn't have come together at the White House to, um, as part of this quad leaders meeting were it not for the challenges and opportunities posed by China. So let me ask you if I can about the US relationship with China. How has the relationship developed over the course of the year from the Anchorage meeting in March to the meeting of the two presidents this month? You were in both meetings. Tell, tell us a bit about them and how you see the bilateral relationship today. Well, thank you. But if I could, Michael, just a moment about the quad. I do think yep. it's important to underscore and to recognize a lot of people will say, well, gee, what is the quad against? That is not how the meetings and the working groups and the leaders' engagements actually are um, uh, uh, developed and proceed. It's really about what we are for. And so each of these leaders believes that it's critical to deliver for their people and for the people of the Indo-Pacific. So it is, it is clear to all four leaders that the Quad has to be relevant and seen as value added, particularly by Southeast Asia, by ASEAN. And that's why so much focus has been presented there. So I would just simply say this is more animated about what we're for rather than what we're against. It is also the case, as you indicate, that, that anxieties about China have risen across the region, region. And that's just undeniable. And you see that uh, manifest in the politics of all four countries involved. 
When the president came to power, he made clear that he wanted to develop a comprehensive strategy that was really had, had many operating features to it. So I would say, you know, we, we think uh, number one about investing at home and you've seen how much work and focus there has been on technology and the like, the ramparts, the arenas of competition that will define the 21st century are less to do just directly with military issues. Those are important, but has much more, Michael, to do with cutting edge technologies, AI, 5G, quantum computing, human sciences. These are the areas where the United States has traditionally had leading advantages and all of them have been challenged. And so part of what the president has sought is to seek bipartisan support for these kinds of domestic investments that will carry us well into the 21st century. And I'm pleased to say that many of those are basically coming to pass now and we'll see more in the time ahead. And so this domestic, uh, even in periods of deep divisiveness and in division in the United States, there is a broad agreement in a bipartisan sense about coming together to deal with the challenges in the Indo-Pacific. So that's the first, and I would say, even though people will say, oh, that's just a throwaway, it is not. It is the most important element in our strategy, a deep bipartisan commitment to making the United States strong. And it is not an accident that when President Biden hosted the call with President Xi, it was immediately after the signing of the largest infrastructure deal that the United States had, had undertaken uh, basically since 1958, since uh, Eisenhower signed um, the uh, Highway Act uh, around the same time that the, the nuclear agreement with Great Britain was signed as well. Excuse me. So <clears throat> I think that's the first element. The second element obviously has been working with allies and partners and you've seen that and we've been discussing that uh, the last little while. The, the feature that is different this time is I've seen more countries want to work more constructively with the United States than I've ever seen before. There are a variety of reasons for that, but what's really changed is um, behind closed doors and often openly, some open anxiety about the direction of uh, China's economic policy, its security, uh, ambitions and its diplomacy uh, in the region and globally. So the, the countries of Europe have been most interested in working with the United States. And that's one of the things that we've sought to build on is in technology and, and in a variety of uh, formats, working closely with Europe on the Indo-Pacific. And Michael, you wrote this great book about, you know, about uh, the Roosevelt's diplomacy with Europe, rendezvous with des destiny. Basically, it can be said that everything that the United States has ever done of significance on the global stage, we've done with Europe. And that has to be replicated in the Indo-Pacific. And we're seeking to do that. And there are challenges, and it's but it's critically important. And then obviously, the last dimension is the bilateral diplomacy. And I think what we've sought to do is not, in the past, we've had large venues, um, some of that diplomacy feels more for show than for results. I don't think we were interested in that. We wanted a clear, defined, strategic set of interactions. And I will just simply tell you that the interaction between the two leaders two weeks ago, I think was exactly what we were looking for. The president was clear, articulate, was extraordinarily um, precise about what the United States was seeking in terms of our uh, own engagement in the Indo-Pacific. I think we tried to underscore that there were concerns uh, in China's policy. I think at the core of our approach is a sense that given the changes in China, the only way you can really engage and get things done in China today is at the senior leader level. And, and, and that from there, uh, you can have uh, developments in policy uh, 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 thereafter with, with, with the people that uh, President Xi and others have, have, have chosen. But at the same time, th there has to be support at the highest level. And what we've seen is a, is a degree of, of, of power that has essentially been accumulated at the leader level that became very clear, particularly after the plenum. 
So I would say, you know, we're 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 very careful about communicating to the Chinese that the dominant paradigm of our relationship right now is competition. Um, we believe that competition can be conducted peacefully, but at the same time, it is essential that we create the mechanisms and the venues where the United States and China can take steps to avoid miscalculation, to prevent uh, misunderstanding, uh, to build confidence where necessary, and at the same time underscore that fundamentally there are still many areas that the United States and China have disagreements on. I, I do wanna say that it is something that countries and, and friends ask, is there anything that the United States and China can do together? And the answer to that obviously is yes. We've tried uh, and we will continue to try to work closely with China on our shared goals with respect to climate. I think there's some proliferation concerns that in Iran and North Korea and elsewhere that I think uh, China's uh, uh, role can be significant and obviously um, uh, uh, in the final stages of the pandemic, a degree of engagement between the United States and China is going to be central. So we are, we, there's a independent interdependence between our two countries. We recognize the significance of China. We are not seeking to undermine uh, China uh, uh, directly, but at the same time, at the core of our um, approach is a strong and determined uh, uh, message. And that is that the United States is not leaving the Indo-Pacific and we're not in decline. And there is a profound belief, I think, among some of the, the more ideological advisors around President Xi that somehow the United States is in this hurtling decline. Uh, Michael, as a student of the United States, you know very well that over decades, there have been many times where countries either prophesized or hoped or feared American decline at the early stages of the Korean War, you know, during Vietnam, more recently in the Asian financial crisis. Each time the United States found something inside that caused itself, caused it to, to surge forward, to reinvent itself. I, I fundamentally believe that the pandemic is going to provide some of that, um, uh, that uh, uh, effort towards innovation that will drive the United States forward and we will rise to the challenge to continue to play a leading role in the Indo-Pacific. All right, Kurt, the president also talked in that meeting about establishing common sense guardrails to prevent the relationship from getting on the, off the rails and to prevent escalation and, and so on. Let me ask you a specific question there. The Pentagon assesses that China likely intends to have at least 1,000 deliverable nuclear warheads by 2030. And in the, week, in the wake of that meeting, the White House indicated that it was open to talks with Beijing to ensure nuclear stability. Do you think China is open to those talks? And what would the administration's objectives be in carrying out those discussions? So, Michael, it's a great question. And again, larger context for friends. So no country in history, no country in history has undertaken such a broad gauge, uh, extraordinary military modernization over the last 30 years as China uh, across every sector, uh, nuclear, conventional, naval, air, land. It, it's, it's a remarkable uh, uh, set of investments. And frankly, it has unnerved it's not talked about as much, but it is a nerve for people enormously in every uh, nation in the Indo-Pacific, but increasingly globally. The thing that has caused um, uh, quite a lot of comment of late uh, is the uh, apparent determination on the part of China to build a substantially more um, larger nuclear deterrent. Uh, and I, I think it is fair to say that the United States is concerned that, that along this course, without proper communications, without understanding doctrine, goals, and ambitions, that, that's potentially destabilizing. And just as we had discussions at early stages of the Cold War, and this is unlike the Cold War, it's a very different relationship, we can come to that. 
But like we did with the former Soviet Union, it is important to have some communications uh, to ensure that we understand, you know, what goals and ambitions are at this stage. And so I think what President Biden and Jake Sullivan said was that we're at the very earliest stages of trying to signal to China that some of these communications are part and parcel of being a, um, a, a responsible uh, global uh, leader. And that too much of what they're doing on the nuclear side, they're doing in secret and uh, with very little transparency. And so to your question about whether China is prepared for these discussions, the answer frankly is that we don't know, but I can assure you that the United States is going to be prepared to engage in ways that will bring and uh, keep strategic stability at a time that China is continuing to build uh, a, a, not just nuclear uh, directly, but an array of delivery systems that, you know, if you put them all together, uh, has the potential to be destabilizing. Kurt, staying on this topic of potentially destabilizing developments, there's been a lot of discussion about um, the reports of a test in July by the Chinese of an intercontinental range hypersonic weapon. Um, General Milley said the United States is very close to a Sputnik moment. How do you assess this development? How concerned is the administration about these reports? Look, you know, there's been a lot of discussion uh, by our military commanders about the specifics of this capability. Um, and they are, um, uh, and, the, and their comments speak for themselves. I think it would be fair to say that there are a number, there are a range of capacities that China is demonstrating. Not only this, but in the anti-satellite realm, in, in the cyber arena, uh, a number of things that we are concerned by and practices that if they continue run risks of, of triggering an unforeseen crisis, or a misunderstanding. And so I think it would be fair to say that, that some of the capabilities are just uh, potentially un, uh, destabilizing in, in and of themselves, and others uh, could uh, trigger a misunderstanding more directly. I, I, I think it would be fair to say that it, it is the combination of all of them together that suggests that China's ambitions and their uh, uh, capabilities are rising substantially and uh, in conjunction. And I think it requires not only vigilance on the part of the United States, but also a determination to carefully uh, explore venues for dialogue and discussion with China to see if we can avoid misunderstandings or uh, uh, steps uh, that can be destabilizing or provocative. Kurt, I know you're very familiar with the Australian debate. You said you, you follow it closely. And so you will have seen that the Taiwan issue, Taiwan Strait, of course, one of the potential flashpoints in the Indo-Pacific, that the Taiwan issue has made headlines in Australia recently. The Defence Minister, Peter Dutton, said it was inconceivable that Australia would not join the United States in any conflict um, across the Straits. And the Shadow Foreign Minister, Sen Senator Penny Wong, said described this statement as wildly out of step with the long-held US policy of strategic ambiguity. Um, what did you make of this exchange? And more broadly, does strategic ambiguity still help to prevent conflict? Or is it time for the United States to openly declare its support for Taipei? Look, I think uh, I do want to just underscore that our policy, Michael, has not changed. Um, I think one of the great achievements of the U.S.-China relationship over decades, a very complex relationship, is in fact the remarkable uh, development that we've seen in Taiwan and our ability to maintain peace and stability. Uh, I do believe that that determination as um, referenced and underscored in the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979 still um, uh, Form, it, it forms the basis of our overall approach uh, uh, in, uh, the, in preserving peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Our, our effort is multifaceted, Michael. So first and foremost, it is, uh, as articulated in the Taiwan Relations Act, 
it requires the United States to have the necessary capabilities to respond to any uh, scenario uh, in the Western Pacific. And you will have seen Secretary Austin, our teams, taking the necessary steps to ensure that we modernize, that we uh, engage appropriately, um, that we have the right forces that we can bring to bear uh, if we faced uh, a crisis of that sort. The second is um, uh, ensuring that Taiwan has uh, the appropriate defensive uh, articles to be able to deter uh, aggression. And that is a mission that has been undertaken over decades and it will continue. Um, and then the third for the United States has been to make sure that we have the closest possible uh, partnership and consultation with Congress about anything that transpires uh, across the Taiwan Strait. And Congress is deeply engaged, as you know, in Taiwan. We have added to that mix a number of other things. And so you will have seen uh, in the last um, uh, several months a number of countries speaking out more directly, including Japan, including Australia, Great Britain and others, that the maintenance of peace and stability across the, the Taiwan Strait is in the strategic interests of all concerned. And, uh, and that this is not just a narrow matter, but a broader issue that, that, that has to be consulted and engaged more directly. Um, I, I do uh, just want to underscore that this is a very delicate matter. We understand the delicate role it plays uh, in U.S.-China relations. But we also believe that if the United States is purposeful, is determined, and is clear in its messaging, that we can maintain peace and stability and to secure the status quo into the future. Kurt, I, I didn't think I'd be able to get you to comment on the Australian debate, but you can't blame a guy for trying. Um, let, me, let me stay on Australia, if I can, just for a couple of minutes, and then I want to go to a couple of audience questions. As I mentioned, you've been a, a source of sound advice to Australians for many years. You're very aware of the debate. What do you say to those Australian observers, including former Prime Minister Paul Keating, but others, who worry that the United States is unwilling to recognise the reality of China's, of China's rise, and therefore... Um, that Australia is heading off in the wrong direction. Mr. Keating memorably recently described the, the proposed acquisition of eight nuclear powered submarines by Australia as like throwing a handful of toothpicks at the mountain, for example. What do you, how, would you, how would you respond to that characterization of Australian policy? Well, can I just first begin by saying, look, I, I think if you, if you look at China's remarkable development, over the last almost 50 years, 45 years. Um, so much went into that, the hard work, the determination of the Chinese people, um, the determination of its system, it's, you know, just striving uh, competition at the core of, of, of the Chinese model. But it is also the case that a number of other things were provided by other countries, including, um, the larger peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific that the United States helped um, underscore, and frankly, the openness of our market where a huge percentage of Chinese goods that were developed were exported to. And so I, I, I think it's important to underscore that the United States is not some observer in what's happened with China. We have been a supporter of China. And I think more recently, the concerns are not, you know, aimed at the United States. What we've heard, the biggest surprise that I've heard, uh, that I've experienced, um, Michael, in this job is that when the door closes in virtually every country I've been engaged with, and now I'm you know, up near 100, the, door, the, the leadership, no matter who it is, says, you know what, the last five or seven years have been very concerning with respect to China, whether it's, you know, uh, wolf war diplomacy, you know, really dramatic economic warfare directed against Australia. I, I'm sure there's a better way to describe it, but it, it's certainly what it appears. More assertive actions in the South China Sea, across the Taiwan Strait, the East Sea, brutal actions along the India border, 
you you add all this up and you 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 see a China that is more risk acceptant, more assertive, uh, more determined to um, basically uh, uh, take steps that that other countries would view as coercive. And so I I, I think that feature plays prominently. And I, I don't believe that that Australia and Great Britain joining with the United States is some uh, evidence of of you know throwing in with uh, an effort that is um, doomed to failure or ir strategically irrelevant. Far from it. I think this is going to be the most important strategic innovation uh, um, of our press of, of, of this period. And I think it's significant and it sends a powerful message um, uh, to every country involved. I, I, I think it would be fair to say, Michael, that seven or eight years ago, if you asked the countries that were most likely to realign strategically um, and kind of rethink its options, you know, near the top of that list would probably be both Great Britain and Australia. Um, look at how much has changed in a very short period of time. And that has largely been driven by Chinese actions. And so those who would critique or criticize this effort, I think have to ask themselves the question, what at the core has driven this effort forward? It is both a clear anxiety about uh, what we've seen in terms of certain actions and policies on the part of China, but it is also a determination that no, I, you know, we have a role in our future and we're going to stand up. So in that respect, I'm extraordinarily proud of this achievement. And I think it will be a defining uh, 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 effort for all three countries involved. Let, let me say for what it's worth, I mean, my own view is the, the principal reason that Australia's policy towards China has changed is that China's, China's changed and China's policy to Australia has changed drastically. I mean, you mentioned, you used the, the, the phrase economic warfare. It's certainly pretty outrageous economic coercion that's being directed at Australia. We're also being subjected to the silent treatment where it's been some years since uh, leaders have spoken and ministers don't get their, their phone calls returned and so on. I think Australians were very grateful by comments from you and other friends in Washington that we won't be left alone on the field. I think, I think that gave us heart. But let me ask you as a student of geopolitics, we also need to be realistic about it, don't we, Kurt? Because the United States has a lot of different issues with China uh, at any one time. And in the end, it's up to Australia to resolve our issues with China, isn't it? Uh, is, is there a danger for us, I guess, is what I'm getting at, in relying on America or hoping that America will fix the problems in the bilateral relationship. It's important for us. I mean, when we're changing our international stance. We're working more closely with partners and allies like the United States and Britain. But how would you suggest beyond that, that we try to re-engage with China and try to get some semblance of a healthy bilateral relationship back on track? Well, Michael, look, I don't need to tell you this. This is something that you understand uh, deeply and clearly. Australia has a deeply significant strategic role to play, both globally and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it uh, values its partnership with the United States, but does not seek uh, nor act in a way that it is uh, simply an adjunct to Washington. That's just so far from how Australia conducts its independent foreign policy. And I see it every day, and I'm extraordinarily impressed by its dexterity and its nuance. Uh, I fully believe that over time that China will re-engage with Australia, but it will, I believe, re-engage on Australian terms. Uh, I think Australia, China's preference would have been to, broke, to break Australia, to drive Australia to its knees, and then you know, find a way forward. Uh, I don't believe that's going to be the way it, it's gonna play out. I believe that China will engage uh, because it is in its own interest to have a good relationship with Australia. And I believe that will happen uh, naturally. And I think that China is a country that 
deep down fundamentally respects strength, fortitude, and resilience. And I can't imagine a country that has demonstrated that more clearly than Australia. All right, just to finish up, let me ask you just a couple of quick questions from our audience members, Kurt. I have a question from Susanna Patton, who's an analyst uh, at the US Study Center who'll be joining the Lowy Institute next year. Susanna asks this, President Biden will reportedly host ASEAN leaders for a summit in January 2022. What outcomes do the, does the United States envisage from the meeting? Will the US seek to upgrade its relationship with ASEAN to a comprehensive strategic partnership? Um, thank you, Michael. I, I, I can't get into exact scheduling, but I will say that we believe that 2022, one of our most important, if not our most important initiatives here in the White House, is to do everything possible to upgrade all of our engagement with ASEAN. And you're going to see it across the board. And I do believe that that means high level leader to leader engagement. It will it will there will be in the economic realm, uh, political, strategic, educational. So we recognize that that um, the critical importance of ASEAN centrality. And I think we want to build on previous examples of high level diplomacy and basically articulate a vision of a close partnership between the United States and ASEAN moving forward. We do understand and acknowledge its strategic significance. Um, and then 2022 will be about that. Kurt, Richard Maud from the Asia Society Policy Institute asks, what happens if competition with guardrails fails? What does plan B look like? So look, uh, I, I do not believe it will fail, but I think we also have to acknowledge that we're at early stages of competition with China and there will probably be some bumps along the way. And it's important to be clear eyed and to be steady and to communicate clearly with allies and partners and also to be resolute in how you approach strategic circumstances. And so I think all of those things will come to play. Um, I think the most important thing is the steadiness and not to be deterred from our overall course, uh, either by, you know, incidents or uh, by inducements. And I think that's going to be our uh, most important mission in the time ahead. Kurt, Eric ba Bagshaw from the Sydney Morning Herald asks whether President Biden raised the matter of China's economic coercion of Australia with President Xi in their recent meeting. What was the thrust of the discussion about Australia, if any, in that meeting? Yeah, um, the president just briefly mentioned activities that China was undertaking that President Biden felt were antithetical to China's interests. So there was a period in our discussion where the president, President Biden, tried carefully to say that some of the steps that China was taking, um, um, in his view, were backfiring. Um, I think our assessment is, Michael, that, that maybe some of the feedback loop in China is not working as effectively as it was in the past. And frankly, what better way to reach the leader um, who may be a bit isolated at the top than have a direct conversation um, with his number one counterpart. So President Biden was very clear and animated about what we had seen in Australia, uh, the border issues with India, all the things that I've mentioned, and just basically said we were concerned. We we're concerned by some of these steps and what it signals with respect to China. Final audience question, Chris Buckley from the New York Times asks about the nature of the US commitment regarding Australian plans to acquire nuclear powered submarines. He says, Australian leaders have spoken as if there's a cast iron assurance that Australia will get nuclear submarines, but is this correct? The AUKUS joint statement talks about shared ambition to support Australia. And Chris asks, ambitions don't always work out, do they? Well, look, the, the purpose of the next 18 months and the reason why the AUKUS effort was um, uh, inaugurated here in the White House was to put our best uh, people together to come up with a plan of action that will enable Australia to build uh, and to, uh, to acquire uh, nuclear submarines at the earliest possible date. 
Um, I think uh, we all recognize that this is an enormous challenge. Australia has no nuclear industry per se. Um, uh, however, I think we were persuaded that Australia, its determination and its commitment when it puts its mind to something uh, is uh, 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 remarkable. And uh, this is a shared commitment among the three countries um, uh, directly. What the, um, what the AUKUS uh, statement uh, uh, indicated when the leaders announced is that this 18 months was really designed to dive deeply into how to do this. Um, and if we ran into um, roadblocks that were insurmountable, those would be identified. But I think the expectation and the belief is that our three countries will work together towards this objective. Uh, and we were able to do this 70 years ago with Great Britain and the expectation is that we'll be able to do it again. I don't think our leaders would have gotten behind it if we didn't think that this was an achievable goal. Or well, I'm going to steal one final question, just a more reflective one, if I can, Kurt. You were last in government in 2013. In the meantime, you had a successful career as an entrepreneur leading a different kind of life. What has it been like being back in harness? And what has changed the most in the eight years that you've been away from government? You mentioned that the attractiveness of the United States, the continued attractiveness of, of the United States to countries in the region has impressed you. But are there any other sort of reflections you, you would make about um, being back in government after this period and your hopes for the future? It's a, it's a good question. It's a hard question, Michael. I will say these jobs are both um, simultaneously exciting, but extremely demanding. And, and they take a toll on your family life and you have to have people that are very supportive of you to be effective. I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged. I think the things that has been most gratifying is to see the young people uh, that are coming up in our system that are deeply knowledgeable and capable on issues on the Indo-Pacific. So the, the next generation of strategists are so much stronger than mine that it, it just to see them, their training and their 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 determination. And you know, many of them work in my office, and that's just wonderful. I, I will also say that, you know, some of it is very daunting. Um, Michael, I, I had a chance to speak with you. I was one of the first people in the White House um, on inauguration day. I never thought I would be coming into government, you know, escorted by an armored Humvee through wire fences that, that felt more like East Berlin, you know, just, it's shocking to me. Um, and we are living through a period of just enormous divisiveness that, that, that is, you know, felt every single day. Um, but at the same time, it's a great honor. This is, um, this is the most important set of issues. And it's nice to see a set of policies that I believe in fundamentally um, being tackled by the senior most team at the White House and great privilege to work for the president and the vice president. So I, I am glad I did this, um, but it's, it, it's every day, it's, it's a challenge, Michael. Kurt, we know how demanding the job is, and so it's very generous of you to take a full hour at the end of a busy day at the White House to, to speak with me and to take some audience questions. Um, you know, I think this, it's one of the most interesting conversations I've had at the Institute. I think the audience can see the depth and the breadth of your thinking on the region, but also the coherence of the US uh, strategy towards Asia. It's quite an impressive thing when you tote up the, the initiatives and the achievements that you mentioned. You're very humble, also talking about the next generation of strategists. There's a lot of um, brilliant young Asia hands, but I know all of them look to you and um, you've really paved the way in the US system for that generation of, of strategists and policymakers and thinkers. So Kurt Campbell, thank you very much for your time. You're doing really important work in Washington and we wish you well. Thanks, Kurt. Hey, Michael, also thanks to the Lowy Institute for the work that you are doing. We're so grateful uh, for the work that we've done in partnership. Reach out anytime. Um, we're appreciative of your role 
and all your researchers. So thank you very much for this opportunity as well. Thank you, Kurt.